All right, hey everybody. So uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, today we have Dr. Dietrich. Last time he was here, he talked to us about Hep C. So we're going to talk about hepatitis B uh, and hopefully some uh, exciting new treatments coming down the pipe. So. <coughs> Yeah, I think we've had a few setbacks in our exciting new treatments, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so let's talk about hepatitis B. Um, so forgive me for some of you who have heard this story before. <coughs> Fellows here? Not yet. <laughs> One. <coughs> Uh, so it was actually, the, <clears throat> the story of the discovery is a pretty good one. Um, actually, in 1963, Australia antigen was discovered, um, which means they were studying um, the Australian indigenous people, and they found this protein, uh, a spike, actually, uh, using an SPEP machine. <laughs> and so whenever in science we get a new instrument, we do it on everybody. So, you know, we get a new fiber scan, we fiber, it's just approved for hepatitis C, we use it on everybody, you know, try to figure out how it, how it works, whether it'll work or not. So, um, uh, later in 1963, a guy named Baruch Blumberg was at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Pittsburgh, and he was um, playing with his new SPAP machine, and he decided to send uh, his lab tech next door to this uh, Institute for the Developmentally Disabled, mostly Downs. Uh, patients back then in the 60s, Downs, Downs folks uh, didn't, didn't stay home. They went off to institutions, actually. So there was a whole institution full of people with Down syndrome. And he, he drew blood from everybody in the institution. You know, you didn't need IRBs back then. There was no, uh, nobody watching. You just did what you wanted. Uh, so he did, uh, he had his lab tech go over there, draw blood on all on the whole institution, and, um, and lo and behold, he found this protein spike in the, uh, on, on the SPEP. Uh, all 99% all, all of the people there who had Down syndrome had this protein spike. So he had written the paper already and was getting ready to submit it for publication that he identified the Down syndrome protein. Uh, he was ready to go. When his lab tech uh, actually came in to talk to him, and he said, uh, you know, Dr. Blumberg, I have a problem and I have a confession to make. And he says, well, I see you have a problem. Your eyes are bright yellow. You clearly have hepatitis. And he says, well, yeah, and yesterday I was, I, I was a little worried, so I ran my blood on the column, and I have the same protein spike as all of the Downs patients. So Blumberg rapidly concluded he had not acquired Down syndrome. Uh, he had indeed acquired infectious hepatitis uh, from this from the spike, and he had just read the paper on the Australia antigen, so he called uh, Australia. <clears throat> Remember, there's no email or FedEx or anything then, and they uh, they shipped him some of their antigen, and uh, lo and behold, it was the same um, actually antigen. Uh, <clears throat> so he actually um, discovered hepatitis B. Now I don't know. This is the first one that was discovered. Uh, I don't know why Baruch Blumberg. Uh, otherwise known as Barry, named this hepatitis B. And maybe it's just a coincidence um, <clears throat> or not. Anyway, so he named it hepatitis B. And actually, and of course, in the lab tech got hepatitis B, and Blum Blumberg got the Nobel Prize only like seven or, seven or eight years later, uh, actually. This is kind of unusual, uh, which was really rapid uh, for that. But <clears throat> we now celebrate World Hepatitis Day, July 28th. Uh, which is also Allison's birthday, uh, actually, because it's Blumberg's birthday, uh, actually. So um, he, he discovered it. And um, so, and the first S antigen assay test for, for to screen blood went into effect in 1971, but the first vaccine uh, wasn't licensed until 86, and it didn't become practice um, until 1991. So that's something to remember. So we still see acute hepatitis B in people who were 29 years of age or older because they never got vaccinated uh, as kids. They all, the pedi pediatricians only vaccinated the newborn in, newborn in 1991, uh, not the older kids. 
So we still see the post-divorce acute hepatitis B uh, in our 30-something-year-olds um, because they don't, they never think to get vaccinated after that unless they got vaccinated in college. Most colleges didn't really, don't always, I mean, a lot of colleges don't, don't insist on that any, anymore. Uh, interferon was licensed, adafavir was licensed, lamivudine was licensed for hepatitis B in 2015, but I think in 2005 it was approved for um, uh, HIV, um, and then PEG, and then entecavir, telbivudine, Tenofovir, also the same thing. It was approved in 2001 for HIV um, and uh, 2008. Uh, and then TAF was finally approved in 2017. Um, so the, actually, the, the guidelines all say there's really only three drugs that are three drugs that are approved, TAF, Tenofovir, and Tecavir for hepatitis B. Uh, so interferon is kind of a waste of time. It's hard to get people to take it. Um, and it's not that effective unless we use it in combination with something else. So, for instance, we're using it in our Iger study of um, uh, lonafarinib to treat delta hepatitis. Um, so, interferon plus lonafarinib. And it's uh, delta hepatitis is the only 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 virus that seems to have a, a reasonable um, cure rate with um, with with interferon. So, globally. Um, this is a way low number. A lot of people think this is closer to a billion uh, people that have that have surface antigen. Uh, probably three billion that have been exposed to hepatitis B, so they will have core antibody. Um, it's a pretty big number, and about a, almost a million deaths a year actually from hepatitis B. Um, that's a, that's a huge number globally, right? A, mil a million, almost a million people dying. A, for and it's probably more than that too, because there's some of this stuff doesn't get recognized. You know, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Does that include HCC or is that just? Yeah, it includes HCC. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Now, um, hepatitis B is clearly older than 1963, right? Um, this actually is a, a mummy that they found. Um, in, uh, in Italy, just uh, just south of Naples, around Pompeii and Herculaneum, uh, from about um, the 1600s, I'm sorry, 1500, so six, six, 600 years ago. And they thought he had varicella, died of smallpox, which wouldn't be surprising with the skin lesions like that. But then they, they ran the DNA, uh, actually, and there were no varicella sequences um, in this guy's uh, skin. So they actually checked for hepatitis B, and occasionally hepatitis B, because of its a huge antigen excess, uh, has skin rashes as well. So it turned out this, this young, young kid had uh, hepatitis B, uh, actually. And it was, um, there it is here, San Domenico Maggiore. Uh, he, here's the mummy wrapped in his swaddling clothes here, about, about an eight-year-old child uh, back then. And then you can see lesions all over his body. Um, <clears throat> so when they ran the DNA, they said, uh, oh, great, we're going to have some, some paleovirology here. We can date the virus back to when it entered mankind. Uh, so here it is here. And it's actually a virtually, the, it's almost exactly the same virus um, that we have now, genotype C. It's the same virus. And it's the same virus as the mummy they discovered in Korea from almost exactly the same time period a few years before that where they did a laparoscopic liver biopsy on this, um, on this it was about an eight-year-old kid also on, the, on, on this kid uh, who had actually a fine liver, but they were able to sequence the virus and it was this, it's the same virus. So it's like, oh shit, we can't go back because this virus has not changed any in 600 years. You know, this is mind boggling for viruses because most viruses have to mutate in order to survive. Hepatitis B doesn't do that. Doesn't, it hasn't mutated in 600 years. Um, it's still the same virus. Um, <clears throat> so it was genotype D, not C. Sorry, both of them were both of them were um, were D. Okay, and then we actually there was a little break here. Um, I believe this was in Science Magazine as well, but it's also in the New York Times. Okay, they found the skeletal remains in a mass grave in um, Germany. There were 15 of them. I think, and all of them had hepatitis B, actually. 
two teams of re researchers independently discovered uh, 15 ancient skeletons, the oldest from about 7,000 years ago. So actually, they were able to finally um, <clears throat> notice that there was a difference in the DNA, and that the, uh, this, these, the HBV DNA in these 7,000-year-old skeletons uh, actually uh, has a little bit of sequence homology with gorilla hepatitis B. So it's still basically the same virus, it just has a little bit of sequence homology with the, uh, with the uh, gorilla hepatitis B. So basically that, that tells us that this virus actually came out of Africa with us, humans, actually. It's probably been with us, okay, um, who, who knows how long. Maybe Lucy, the Australopithecus, had it, you know, or certainly the gorillas had it, and then, you know, it's like, and it moved with us you know, across uh, Africa, um, into Europe, Asia, and then across, across the land bridge to um, Alaska, all across Canada, and to Greenland, actually. So all those indigenous peoples in Greenland, uh, Canada, and Alaska all have actually very high levels of hepatitis B. I got in trouble once for saying something about viruses come out of Africa, but Aristotle said it first, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he got in trouble for it or not, but there's always something new coming out of Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so, USPSTF screening recommendations, uh, household and sexual contacts, I'll talk about that in a second. Individuals, injection drug users, I, honestly, we th I think everybody should be, should be screened for hepatitis A, B, and C. All of our kids are vaccinated for A and B, so I think it's perfectly reasonable to um, to vaccinate everybody for A, B, and C. There's a new B vaccine called Heplosav. It's two shots, one month apart. It's about 98% effective, way, way more effective than the old three shots. Because the third shot, only 50% of people ever showed up for the third shot. So it actually, um, they can't remember. They can remember one month, but they can't remember six months to come back for that, for that follow-up. The vaccine is available here. Available here, yep, it's on our formulary. Um, all you gotta do is order it. We have it over at the 102nd Street. Um, now, just to, just to um, I make two points about household and sexual contacts, and, um, and actually, uh, the thing that you all know forever, if, you, if, uh, if somebody, if a baby gets hepatitis B, um, they're usually going to become chronically infected. If an adult gets it, they almost always clear it. Um, so, because of the... Um, 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 immature immune system of babies, they will actually, they, they have trouble clearing the virus. And then, but, but adults, most adults, 95% probably will clear the virus. Uh, so I have a patient who uh, came to me when he came to college, went to college at Columbia. He came from Chicago. Um, and he had a, actually a very high viral load. It was like a billion uh, use and he was just he just turned 18 and there was no you know PD I don't know whatever they were doing in Chicago and at any rate I said well how did you get it uh, hepatitis B um, and he said well his his parents are, are partners at a big Chicago law firm and he has an older sister who is six uh, and when he was born they decided they needed a nanny they hired a Haitian nanny and within a couple of months of uh, her her arriving at the household everyone had hepatitis B. Uh, mom, dad, older sister, and the baby, you know, him. Uh, everybody cleared, except for he, him, actually. Um, they, they all cleared the virus, but he actually had a, had a high viral load infection. Uh, and uh, Columbia is also one of those colleges that doesn't um, vaccinate for hepatitis B. So I thought probably Probably a good idea to treat this guy. Um, and it turned out we had an Intecavir clinical trial. This is a little bit off the record, but at any rate, uh, going on at this, at this time. So we got him free drug, um, Intecavir. And so he didn't want anybody to know he was taking his medicine. Um, so he and his buddies went on a ski trip, you know, up, um, up north somewhere in, you know, in the winter. So he, he wanted to be surreptitious. He, he put all of his... Uh, his Intecavir for a week, all seven pills, and the little finger of his ski glove, so his, his buddies wouldn't 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 see it, you know. And then he, when he got there, uh, <clears throat> in the next morning, he kind of forgot that the ski glove had been a little wet. So it, uh, when the pills came out, they were all like one little finger, basically. <laughs> so he emailed me. He said, 
He said, I, I bit off one seventh of the little finger <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, think, you think that's okay, Doc? I said, well, we're not going to mention it to the clinical trials people, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think that's perfectly, uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> he, he did not have a flare. No, he was fine at that point. He was undetectable. So it's now New York State law to, uh, to screen pregnant women um, and uh, well, HPV screening in people who are at high risk. Uh, and in terms of, I don't think I have the slide in here, in terms of treating pregnant women, we, we do that a lot now. The number that Calvin Pan and his group generated in a clinical trial, placebo-controlled trial in China, of course, was uh, 200,000 IUs. So if mom's HPV DNA is 200,000 IUs or more, um, then uh, uh, treatment on the third trimester is, is, um, is, is highly recommended. Our OB group here has lots of Asian OBs. They're very comfortable with it. Now they don't even call us, frankly, most of the time. Uh, and they just go ahead and use tenofovir to treat their pregnant women um, with, um, um, uh, you know, with, with, with higher viral loads. I mean, some pregnant women we treat with lower viral loads because they want to be treated. And I understand that. And I, <clears throat> that's perfectly OK with me. Tenofovir is category B. TAF um, hasn't, doesn't have a category. But you can presume that it's probably going to be category B because it's just a different version of tenofovir. Now this is the sort of the, the this is the, the Bible of hepatitis B therapy. This study um, um, actually was first published in 2006 and then 2007, and it continues. <clears throat> actually, it started um, with 80,000 people in Taiwan. They had um, um, they looked at 22,000 here for a case control study, surface antigen negative versus surface antigen positive people, and this is survival. As you can see, just being S antigen positive is a significant um, um, risk for survival. And then this is how we think about hepatitis B, or this is how we're supposed to think about it, I think. Um, the, the people who write the guidelines don't seem to think about this too much. Um, but basically what this shows is that up to 10,000 copies, these are copies here, 10,000 copies here, <clears throat> there's really no significant difference in survival. So that, which is 10,000 copies divided by five is 2,000 IUs. So that's where that 2,000 IUs comes from, uh, basically, in the guidelines. Uh, there's no mention in this study of, uh, of ALT, of AST, of AFP, of E antigen, uh, you know, or anything else. The only thing that was statistically significantly associated with survival was HBV DNA that was less than 2,000 IUs. So, why the guidelines decided to make up numbers about ALT, um, I'm not entirely sure. They've changed quite a bit. They used to be five times upper limit of normal to treat, then three times, then two times, now anything above the upper limit of normal. And then they, then they moved it down to the ASLD upper limit of normal, which is 25 for women, 35 for men. So uh, still insane from as far as I'm concerned. Um, because look at this, actually. This is the uh, progression to HCC and liver-related death in the, quote, inactive carriers, that is, the patients with, with high viral loads and uh, normal, quote, normal mm -hmm. ALT. So uh, here, inactive carrier, I hate that word. Um, actually, somebody who's infected with hepatitis B could have a billion IUs, but he's still inactive, according to um, these old guidelines here. So look at the... Um, the cumulative risk hazard of HCC or liver-related death here, mm -hmm. uh, even if you're less than 2,000 2, IUs. I'm sorry, this is, yeah, right, inactive carriers, less than 10,000 copies. So I treat most of these people, and of course these over here too, this is the risk of uh, uh, HCC, which is the bigger worry, frankly. Uh, because with, H, with, with hepatitis B, you don't have to have cirrhosis, you don't have to have fibrosis, you don't have to have inflammation to get HCC. We see HCC in kids, we see HCC in 20-year-olds with totally normal livers. Uh, and here, look at the difference here. And this is actually less than, less than 2,000 I use. So who do, you, who do you not treat? Anybody else with 2,000? 
Well, you know, I, I tell them this, that they're less than 2,000. There's other, <laughs> other things to think about. Um, I'll show you in a, in a second. Um, these are carriers, okay? <laughs> These are carriers, okay, and they're extinct. Those are carrier pigeons. So I don't think we should use that word. And actually, our, frankly, our, our former fellow, Kosh Agarwal, uh, actually uh, published these new guidelines at EASL a couple years ago. Uh, the EASL guidelines the, the, and the APOSL guidelines, the, the Asian, are, are all more aggressive than this. But at least uh, he got rid of the, um, the old terminology here, immune tolerant, immune reactive, because it doesn't really matter frankly, uh, whether there's elevated ALT or not. So basically, he's E-antigen positive chronic infection, which means your ALT is normal, or you have E-antigen positive chronic hepatitis, which means you have elevated um, ALT. Um, so you, you could just sort of think about it that way. Uh, and here's the 2,000 number for the E-negatives. Some people say it's 20,000 here for the E-positives, but uh, I think 2,000 is a better number to be, to be, to be thinking about. So <clears throat> there's one solid rule for treating hepatitis B. Okay, there are no rules because uh, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, basically, you know, I get text messages all the time. How can this patient be S antigen positive and S antibody positive? How can they be E antigen positive and E antibody positive? How can they be S antigen negative and DNA positive? All that stuff happens, actually. This virus hadn't read the book, okay? And it certainly hasn't read the guidelines. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of this, you know, sort of brings me back to where we were with HIV a long time ago. It's like, oh, wait for 200 T cells before you treat. Oh, then maybe 350. Well, then maybe 500. Oh, back to 350 again. And then, oh, shit, just treat everybody. Um, <laughs> And that's where we are with HIV. And I think we're probably going to get there with, uh, with hepatitis B, you know, as well. So when we're thinking about the treatment, okay, obviously we want to knock the DNA down, uh, which the knocking the DNA down does help seroconversion. Uh, and we want the DNA to be, to be negative. And then, of course, if you keep it negative long enough, the, the idea is maybe you can clear surface antigen. And then sort of the, whole, the beginning of the, the first part of the holy grail here is getting rid of the CCC DNA, which we'll talk about, and then the clearance of the integrated um, HPV DNA sequences and those cells that, are, uh, that have integrated HPV DNA. And these are the three drugs that we talked about, TAF being the newest, <clears throat> and nobody's using interferon. So these are the things, <laughs> Scott, that, uh, that we kind of think about. It's not really a binary decision. You know, I'm not a big believer in just looking at the guidelines. Um, this is for risk factors for HCC, but that's what's going to kill your patient is HCC, not cirrhosis, uh, <clears throat> basically. So age over 40, age and ethnicity, uh, male gender, family history of HCC is huge. It's huge extra risk. Uh, this is if they're from Africa, um, high alcohol, alcohol, and it's consumption and smoking. Q-type C makes things worse. And then the, the uh, pre-core or the basal core promoter um, mutations actually are the same risk as having a family history of HCC. So this is why we do genotyping on all of our patients uh, to get this actually a result to see if they have a BCP mutation, uh, even if some of them don't know their family history or some of them say there some somebody died of liver cancer but they're not sure if it wasn't metastatic colon cancer or something you know it's difficult sometimes to reconstruct these family histories and then of course cirrhosis is obvious hpv dna level which is high prolonged e antigen positivity so basically it's if you remember those reveal curves it's kind of the viral load over time which is increases your risk for hcc mm -hmm. so you know if we can knock that viral load down um, down to zero, we can reduce your risk of HCC to the background risk. Not never zero, like in hepatitis C, but the background risk. Do you change your screening um, protocol based on viral load? Uh, will you increase the frequency of some of plus thousand? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, we might just do once a year, even though we're supposed to do it twice a year. It's hard to get them to come in. 
you know, and screening is usually, or surveillance is AFP and ultrasound twice a year. If they've ever had cirrhosis, frequently they'll get a lot better. Then we alternate MRI and ultrasound. Andrea? Yeah. Genetics versus shared, say, environmental exposures or like aflatoxin. This, yeah. yeah. Microbiome. <laughs> microbiome. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. All the same genetic strain of the virus because it's. Uh, right. They would all have the same, the same genotype, yeah, right? Typically. Right. Exactly. Genotype. And you know, I, I think well, maybe um, uh, you know, Augusto can talk to us about it uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the. Uh, you know, people think the risk of HCC is related to integration, you know, of the virus into the genome. I don't think uh, the Lovett group believes completely in that, right? No, no, they, they, they think they do believe in that. Oh, they do? Okay. He's, he's changed his mind, then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. HCC might be a surrogate marker for vertical transmission. Well, I mean, the longer you have it, well, the more likely you are to have it. Right? Why family history shows up because it's a mark. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. To what extent have people teased out what causes family history to be a risk? No, no. Well, what about oncogenes? Are they? Uh... Well, there are a couple of studies on GWAS, mostly in Asian patients with hepatitis B, HCC. And, and there are a couple of SNPs that correlate with the risk of HCC, so there may be some germline components. Yeah, but it's not right. that impressive. I mean, those mutations don't really account for, for much of the much of the risk in a population. So It'd be a com combination. Yeah, of no, I'm sure. It could yeah, be. it's a pretty I messy combination, if probably. Anybody sort of had pieced it out, and you could also think it would vary depending upon which society you're looking at. But I just think that's very interesting. Why yeah. family history is such an important. Well, they all get exposed to aflatoxin, alcohol, and smoke together, and I guess. <laughs> what about the hepatitis B from Africa? Do you think that these patients have... Well, I think that's the, presumably that's the aflatoxin exposure. So the recommendations for ma in many, many guidelines is to screen at age 20 uh, in Africans, actually age 40 in Asians. So we've definitely at least seen 20-year-old 20, 20 uh, HCCs in our African patients. I just saw a 30-something-year-old guy, you know, first... You know, first visit for HCC, we send him for an MRI, and he, first visit for Hep B, Hep B and he has a uh, has an HCC. But <clears throat> actually, he, he was lucky; it got resected, and he's undetectable now. Oh well. So the other reason I send this while we're on the subject, we while well, we send the genotype. <clears throat> With genotype, you also you get the you know genotype A B C D. You get the precore and basal core promoter mutations. You also get drug resistance. Okay, that's important, particularly in this town. Because, okay, um, the Chinese herbs that they sell for hepatitis B downtown in Chinatown have lamivudine in them. Okay, so I have people that we've tested, young women, never took anything but Chinese herbs for their hepatitis B, and they, when they come in on their first visit, they're, they're a lamb resistant, uh, actually. So, which means you really can't give them entecovir. So, that's an important uh, you know, uh, determinant, actually, of what you're going to treat them with. In general, um, Childbearing age women, we give tenofovir to anyway in case they get pregnant. That's category B, and tecovir is category C. So, Pani? The only other thing uh, in the ASLB guidelines for the new FB um, update is 40 uh, for black men, but that's based on data on African American right. men. Um, and so it's kind of muddies the waters in terms of what is the best screening age for an African born person. Um, so, I think there we don't have enough data. Probably is going to be a younger age. That uh, you know, we screen everybody. I screen everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, the ones that are, have a super low risk, I just do once a year. You know, like the twenty-something-year-olds. But the one, once they get to be forty and fifty, then we're going to we go yeah. make sure we try to make sure they get get it twice a year, uh, actually, because it's like yeah. So they keep just like with the HIV story. It's like oh, fifty, and then Asian men forty. You know, and then African American men forty, Africans twenty, and it's like. Oh shit! Just screen everybody. Uh, you know, it's like what? This, if he's thirty-nine, you're not going to screen the guy. You know, if, but if he, what if he's a smoker? You know, and a drinker and has fatty liver. You know, it's like it seems kind of silly. So, um, you know, we we try to stay on top of it, screening at least once a year in everybody. 
and then our higher risk patients, you know, twice. Do you get any pushback from insurers? Only on MRIs, actually, only on MRIs. And that's why we, in our higher risk patients, we alternate MRI once a year and ultrasound once a year on the six months apart. Now, <clears throat> a couple years ago, we, have, um, we got S antigen levels approved um, in the US. Uh, it, that's a great thing, except for they're only done by Quest Labs, not by LabCorp, which means we can't get them here unless we send our patients out to the Quest Lab, uh, because they are, they were there, you know, since LabCorp owns our outpatient labs, we, you know, they, they refuse to send lab tests to Quest. Um, yeah, we've, Punny and I fought, fought this fight for a long time to try to get this to happen. It doesn't happen. But I, it, basically, it's just another prognostic marker, higher S antigen levels usually just correlate with higher viral loads. But as you can see here, even with people low viral loads, high S antigen levels, actually the things are much worse. So it's a bit another, if, you, uh, if you're not sure about treating a lower viral load patient, this is another thing that actually might push you over the edge to treat somebody with less than 2,000. Now S antigen is a good predictor of, of uh, seroconversion. And actually as surface antigen dro levels drop here, um, actually, you can, it does predict uh, zero conversion, and this is kind of what we're looking for is on the on these all these clinical trials with the new drugs is S antigen drop or at least zero conversion. Now, and the reason is, um, <clears throat> Blumberg was really lucky in many ways, actually, because his his instruments were so crude, he was able to pick up the, the S antigen um, actually in the in the blood of these of these folks. Uh, because the levels are so high. So uh, an average, I mean, to pick up a, a positive S antigen in, in your average lab test, you have to have a million particles per ml. Now, it's not viral particles. It's just S antigen particles. It's like, and remember the Dane particle, and then there's empty virioids and, you know, just straight pieces of, uh, you know, of S antigen floating around. So there's like trillions of viral particles floating around, you know, for what reason? Viruses are not usually inefficient. They don't do something for no reason and be selected for over the last, whatever, 30 million years uh, for, right? So it wasn't until we started doing these cure studies that we kind of figured it out that this S antigen is there on purpose, actually. It's to shock and awe the immune system into submission. Uh, so the immune system just surrenders about this, over, this onslaught of antigen, uh, and it's figures we, this can't possibly be a foreigner. It must be us. So we're not going to attack it. Uh, <clears throat> so it does make a big difference. So the point is, if you can knock the S antigen down, you can allow the immune system to, um, to restore itself and maybe clear the virus. Um, <clears throat> so this is a controversy at, the, at EASL. This one paper presented 30,000 patients um, <clears throat> here receiving tenofovir and entecovir. Now, only uh, 28,000 got uh, entecovir. 1,300 got tenofovir, so there are some criticisms of this paper, but five-year cumulative HCC incidence was seven times higher in the entecovir group. Now, <clears throat> actually, they published this in JAMA, and it was actually um, retracted uh, a couple weeks later after a shitstorm of, of, of uh, statistical um, complaints about how they did it. So they redid it actually, and the, and the final numbers are this, and they actually resubmitted it to JAMA, and it was accepted actually as a modified um, modified paper. So uh, this is the univariate analysis for five-year HCC um, uh, incidence here, one for tenofovir, so one in seven there. If they did propensity scoring weighting, it was one in three, and propensity scoring matching, it was one in two. It was twice as high. So everything's still higher. Uh, it's not clear why this is, actually. Uh, the matching here actually was not significant. Everything else was in terms of, of, of p-values. So Max, you have an opinion about this? Statistical stuff looks, looks <laughs> right. Anyway, it's complicated, but it does, it does appear that tenofovir is a little bit better at uh, preventing HCC than in tecovir. Exactly. Did this study just come out from France saying they didn't find this to be the case? There's been about four or five studies now. It's like four go this way, one co goes the other way. It figures the French would go the other way. Um, uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so a lot of them have no difference 
uh, actually, well, a few have no difference. Most have, have a f in favor of tenofovir, actually. So it's, it's not entirely clear what the answer is. No, not really, actually. No. I mean, I, you know, I have a lot of little old Chinese ladies who had cirrhosis who were on lamivudine when I first met them about 10 years ago. So if they're on tenofovir or on TAF, it's like we kind of just leave well enough alone. Um, and if, they're, if their kidneys are okay, um, uh, you know, we don't, I was, was, most of them are lamivudine resistant when we started them, so we had to give them tenofovir or even Truvada. Um, and those are the folks important to remember. We still do HCC screening, even though their fiber scan now is normal. You know, and they came into me with ascites and edema. They were totally decompensated. Fiber scans are normal, but they still get HCC. Um, so we're still screening, actually, and picking up HCCs in these folks. One of mine just zero converted at age 82. Actually, we didn't even tell her because we're not going to stop uh, <laughs> the medicine. I don't think I'm not quite sure if she would understand either. Um, but anyway, so definitely treating makes a difference. Actually, this is observed versus predicted in the in the Reach B model here. So observed on tenofovir. Um, and observed here on Entecavir. Uh, actually, this is the four-year study, uh, mostly non-serotics. So in terms of reactivation, um, you know, um, rituximab is the worst. So anybody who has core antibody has CCC DNA, basically. So if you suppress their immune system enough, they will um, they will reactivate. So rituximab is the, is the worst offender here, but uh, almost any kind of immunosuppression it can happen with, but it happens most with rituximab, and then in declining, um, actually, uh, order, uh, you know, all the way down to um, the, uh, the, I, the, uh, the IBD drugs, the psoriasis drugs, et cetera. Venom. What's your experience with the patients with Hep B core positives and HCC? I know it's not very common, but it can happen. Just core, just isolated just core. core. Yeah. And what's the, what, the HCC what? rates? Do we know that? Oh, yeah. I don't. I, I don't. You said they have CCDNA. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. Actually, I actually don't know. Actually, uh, those are hard to find because most people don't don't even look for it. Mm -hmm. Actually, so this was another update from Easel. Uh, this is something that's not exactly new. Uh, this is uh, if you stop suddenly your um, nuke, nuke therapy, you get a flare, uh, uh, actually. And then uh, if the patient survives the flare, sometimes they clear the S antigen. This seems a little primitive to me. I mean, this was the original treatment that Jay Hoofnagel was using back in, in the 80s for hepatitis B. He'd give people 50 milligrams of prednisone for a month, actually, then stop suddenly and see if they would flare. And if they survived the flare, uh, <laughs> then they could clear their S antigen. Um, seems a little crude, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, so when we talk about curing hepatitis B, functional cure has a clear benefit, which means S antigen um, negative or S antigen clearance. It doesn't have to be zero conversion. Uh, and then if S antigen goes away, generally CCC DNA levels go down or the, the cells that are infected with CCC DNA uh, become many fewer. Uh, of course, you still have this risk and then we still see people who do this all the time, either on treatment or even spontaneously, although spontaneously is pretty rare. And then the sterilizing cure uh, would be huge. Um, that's CCC DNA eradication and integrated HPV DNA removal. Uh, <clears throat> so we're not certain yet we can do that. Um, uh, actually, so there's that's still theoretical. So knock down the S antigen, control viral replication, cripple the virus, and then reactivate the um, the host immune response. And then hopefully this will actually be able to clear the CCC DNA. Although some of our new drugs uh, may have a triple threat, I'll show you um, that <laughs> that may be able to clear CCC DNA uh, by inhibiting uh, the, uh, the the capsid. So this is phase two effectiveness. This is an easel ASLD workshop and treatment endpoints. So more than one log decline in S antigen in half the patients. 
S antigen loss in 30% and S antigen loss in more than 10% here. And then the, for phase three trials, S antigen loss in 30% of patients, which would be huge. Now we're talking you know, one to 3% per year on treatment. So one of the immune inhibitors, I mean, immune stimulators actually is this drug, an uh, uh It's a rig eye um, um, agonist. Uh, actually, although I, we were talking about this, the clinical trial meeting actually, we were going to get a clinical trial for this, and I know Nid Oftal went to work for these guys 80% uh, of the time. Springbank is the company. And then he just, just recently came back to be a deaconess to be the chief, um, which tells me that it's probably not going to work. <laughs> it's probably not going to work. <laughs> he probably got a better offer to go work at the BI deaconess salary. He would have been the otherwise. Yeah. Well, he's actually got plenty of money. He's made money in Irish oil, actually, believe it or not. Um, there is such a thing, actually. His brother, his brother um, got him into the Irish oil business. Anyway, so it works in terms of, uh, this is the HPV DNA, but not S antigen, which is, um, which is what we're kind of talking about. Okay, so this is how smart the virus is. It enters through a bile acid um, receptor on the S antigen. Right, so you can't really um, can't really expect uh, cells not to have bile acid receptors. So you can't kind of mutate your way to protect yourself out of this. So Hep B enters the cell. It gets uh, um, the capsule gets gets um, um, re removed here, disassembly. Uh, the viral DNA. Uh, this is in, in a, uh, the, well, the first time it creates CCC DNA, and then after that, it actually goes to repair. HPV DNA, transcription, translation, uh, pregenomic RNA here, and then the core assembly uh, and packaging, and then uh, uh, DNA synthesis here. This is where nucleoside analogs work. Uh, and, then, uh, and then actually there's this refreshing cycle where the CCC DNA degrades here if you don't keep refreshing it um, uh, <clears throat> here with, uh, with new um, DNA. And then, then there's um, once you have the the the, um, the, the, the core uh, and the S antigen wrapped around it, then it gets uh, through the multivesicular body, picks up the surface antigen, and then it goes goes out back um, to do to do bad things again. So um, several ways to attack this. There's a DNA destabilizer. This is the Arbutus one here, AB, uh, and the capsid inhibitors here. So. Uh, yeah, Arbutus uh, stock uh, last year was three bucks fifty. Um, uh, this year it's thirty-five cents. I think it's on sale. Uh, uh, makes me think that all these Arbutus drugs are sucking wind. I know the first two had some problems actually, um, and they got rid of their CMO and they hired somebody else. And so that doesn't this doesn't look too promising either. This particular company. Uh, just, just, just inferring from the, the stock market data. Um, however, the important thing is there's a lot of these um, these capsid inhibitors out there. So the really nice thing about these these capsid inhibitors is it's, they, they they sort of have a triple function. So it's kind of a triple threat antiviral. So the capsid um, actually is required to disassemble the capsid as well to allow the HPV DNA to enter the nucleus. That's the first step. And then here, it's also required the capsid to, uh, to assemble the, the, um, the packaging of the RNA here. And then, um, and then from here, once it's packaged, actually, it's necessary uh, also to bring it back in to refresh the CCC DNA. So the, the thought being, if you could stop the viruses you know, here, 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 and here from refreshing CCC DNA, the CCC DNA might degrade over time, like all DNA does, and you might be able to eradicate CCC DNA. Now, well, what's the half-life of CCC DNA? How long does that last? We've heard estimates ranging from three weeks to 30 years, actually, so nobody really is, is certain about it. Oh, this is the Merklin XB. So this, this, this drug actually blocks hepatitis B from entering the bile acid receptor. Here it also works for Delta because uh, it works through the same, the same channel. 
Um, so here it is here. The core inhibitors block viral replication in all these different ways. Um, so, and in terms of the trafficking to the, trafficking to the nucleus, uh, uh, actually to refresh the, um, the, the RNA there. So this is actually a very elegant experiment that, um, that Rich Colono did. Rich, Rich Colono works for assembly now. He's the guy who invented Entecavir. Um, so what he did was um, he, he looked at CCC DNA. And we know the genetic source of resistance is shown to be CC, archived in CCC DNA. So if you get resistant to lamivudine, it's archived in the CCC DNA. So whenever you get exposed to lamivudine, again, it'll just pop right back up, just like with HIV drugs, right? So it's there. It's in this. Once you've got it, you've always got it there. The, the, the 204 and the 184B um, um, mutations, which is also in pre-genomic RNA. So he went back to all his old buddies in the Hep B business, where we, we did those first trials with lamivudine, uh, with adafavir, with telbividine. FDA wanted liver biopsies. So we had liver biopsies before and after. Um, we treated the patients. And a, a significant number of lamivudine and telbividine patients got resistant to the virus over the course of the year. So those, those would be archived in the... Um, in the CCC DNA. And then, of course, once you stop the, um, the pressure of the, uh, uh, of, the vi of, of the antiviral, right, those things tend to go away, right? So he looked uh, to see how long it took for the lamivudine resistance mutations to go away, uh, basically, after you stop the lamivudine. Actually, and the number he came up with was 12 to 16 weeks, which was really shocking, frankly. Um, that it was that, that short of time, like not that shocking when you consider how unstable DNA can be, I guess, in, you know, in the, in the nucleus, but relatively rapid turnover of pre-genomic RNA and CCC DNA in, in, those, in these infected pools. So uh, there's no evidence of an inactive subpopulation either, um, as resistance mutations were observed in the entire population of CCC DNA. So it lo does look like then, presumably, if you have a very potent capsid inhibitor, and you keep it going for, well, significantly longer than, I wouldn't go 12 to 16, I probably would go 24 or 48 weeks, presumably you could start depleting the pool of CCC DNA and maybe actually get somewhere with this virus. You can see uh, core <clears throat> uh, capsid inhibitors are pretty popular. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, actually, and this is just from the spring. There's a bunch more now. Janssen's already in trials here. Uh, we're doing the assembly trial now. We're, we've, we're, we've almost finished with it. We just got the, the, um, the ticklers for the Ananta trial. These are two Chinese companies, probably just copied one of these other drugs. Um, here's the um, se second J&J &J drug, uh, backup compounds in assembly. And I, well, like I said, Arbutus has a few uh, too, but they look like they're not working too well. Anyway, so well, it is. It, it, this is the Arbut. This is the. I'm sorry, assembly compound. So with tenofovir plus um, the, the compound here, HPV DNA reduction is much greater uh, with a capsid uh, inhibitor uh, with, with the than, than with entecavir uh, by itself. Now, and actually, this is kind of interesting too. This actually, they they have a, their own assay. The assembly guys looking at uh, viremia below basically two. Now our, our assay goes down to 20, less than 20. Um, <clears throat> theirs, theirs goes down to two. So it looks like the, the people who were getting combination therapy here, uh, after eight weeks, all of them were negative, except there's one guy here, actually, who was, who was uh, slowly getting, getting negative here. Uh, whereas the ones over here who were just getting new monotherapy, everybody was positive. So it does look like actually adding the CAM can actually drive the, the HPV DNA to less than two, which may be as close to zero as we can get. And maybe there's, there is actually significant viral replication between two and 20 that we're not recognizing that may be responsible for some of the HCCs, some of the relapses, you know, some of the, content, the resistance to medications that you see because the virus continues to replicate at these low levels. They do have a backup compound, too, which actually looks even better. Actually, interesting about assembly is that um, 
John McCutcheonson left Gilead to go be the CEO of Assembly. Actually, McCutcheonson is the guy who brought Sofaspavir to market in, uh, in less than two years, actually. Uh, he knows how to do clinical trials. Um, this is another company doing siRNA. This is uh, Galnac, actually, and they, they're looking at uh, two different spots. They think going after the X gene here, which has one, two, three, four, five overlapping reading frames, may be better than, um, the, than the standard uh, places over here where, uh, where people have been looking with overlapping reading frames. And it does look like uh, that may be actually the right idea. Don't know yet for sure. This is J&J &J drug, definitely knocks down S antigen. So two log drop in three months is actually very impressive because it's very difficult to get S antigen levels to drop. Most of the data we've seen so far is HPV DNA. Um, so once you get that down to less than 100, that's when people start to seroconvert, you know, wake up their immune system. This was the Arbutus compounds here, one, two, three. Uh, I guess they're all crashing and burning or something's going on there. I'm not quite sure. Maybe we'll find out when the, what the, the gossip is in Boston. Anyway, uh, so in the U.S., uh, well, we probably have about 3 million people in the U.S. that are uh, infected with hepatitis B. 70% uh, are not aware of their infection. 2% are being treated. So three out of 3 million people, there are 60,000 prescriptions a year in the, in the U.S. written for hepatitis B medication. And they're primarily, the vast majority of those are written by Asian primary care doctors, actually in the Chinese and the Korean communities. That's pretty dismal, actually, when you think about it. <clears throat> um, never monitored nor routinely monitored for ALT DNA, 62% not being monitored, 86% without liver biopsy. Well, that's okay, actually. I don't think we make, we, 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 we're there. Uh, never undergoing uh, HCC surveillance, 62% of patients with cirrhosis not getting surveillance. <clears throat> um, so HCC surveillance, ultrasound and AFP every six months. Um, like I said, we, we're just, we're kind of, a, you know, the, the, these are the new recommendations, Asian men, 40, African American men, 40. Asian women, 50, that's like, I don't discriminate here. I just screen everybody. It's like, it's kind of silly. Uh, really, all, you know, a 39-year-old is different than a 40-year-old in terms of their risk. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, <clears throat> try to sound too smart. You know, you're going to get in trouble. Um, so just, yeah, do, I mean, do it once a, once a year if they're not, if they're low risk, twice a year if they're, if they're high risk. So um, some people think this is an incurable disease so far. I'm not so convinced. Remember, core antibody means CCC DNA. So they're at risk of reactivation if they have core antibody. Uh, so we get a lot of those consults now. Uh, stage them, um, determine the phase of, uh, of treatment. I mean, of, uh, link all patients who, to care who are S antigen positive. Because even if they're actually, we, I've seen actually a 20 something year old woman who was just S positive, DNA negative, with an HCC. Um, Myron resected it, and he sent her to me to treat her. I'm thinking, what am I treating her? I haven't got no DNA. But, you know, I treated her anyway, and after like six years, she seroconverted. Uh, and she wanted to stop, actually. So I said, okay, but you've got to have HCC screening, you know, as long as you promise to come in twice a year for HCC screening. And she's remained uh, DNA and... S, an S antigen negative. She did lose her S antibody, but that doesn't really matter. Still has core antibody. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right, right. Test everybody for Delta. We got that great clinical trial for Delta hepatitis. Uh, consider HIV testing, depending. And you should test everybody for Hep C as well. Actually, uh, the, uh, the the prevalence of Hep C and and the Asian populations you know, from Korea and China is actually significant. It's like. Uh, what do we got? Three or four percent, punny, in our in our Hep B patients, right? Nine percent Hep B, and about three three percent Hep C, actually. And so, of course, some have both. Um, and then reactivation, we kind of talked about. So it's a dynamic disease. We can suppress DNA, reduce inflammation, redu reverse fibrosis, uh, reduce the risk of HCC, but not abolish it. We can control it really well. TAF is our best new drug if we can get it. 
Uh, we got it back again on the Atenough CVS Caremark formulary. Um, the risk of HCC is lowered, but remains, especially on uh, patients who had a history of cirrhosis. So uh, if we do get a, get a cure, it will take di several different drugs with different um, mechanisms of action and um, will likely require both antivirals and maybe a little TLR uh, immune stimulation. <clears throat> so this is our goal here, although I don't think we're getting anywhere near, near that for both either neither B nor C. <laughs> Anyway, so happy to answer any questions that you have. <laughs> Brian. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, that's sort of the same thing as giving them a flare, you know, right? Giving them a checkpoint um, inhibitor. For, there were a couple of studies. The first couple of studies were definitely did not work, um, you know, for that. And that's kind of fraught with hazard. But it's, I mean, it's something, I, you're going to need some kind of immunostimulation, whether you need the, you know, the sledgehammer of a checkpoint um, inhibitor, you know, or whether you need something a little more subtle like a TLR. Uh, agonist, you know, it, it's not not entirely clear yet. Probably depends on the degree of the liver. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'd be a little hesitant to give a checkpoint inhibitor to a cirrhotic right. to try to cause a flare, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your practice, um, for your non cirrhotics that either have a family history or like before BCD mutants, um, do you screen them with just an ultrasound, or do you do all the same with an MRI? Patients? No, if they, I think if they don't, if they've never had cirrhosis, then um, then I, we usually stick with ultrasound and, and AFP. But, and, you, you know, a, a, AFP is, has come and gone from the ASLE guidelines, and now it's sort of back as optional. I don't think it should ever have been optional. I mean, it's really important. It's a great marker. Because what happens is, I think sometimes if you see the AFP start to creep a little bit, then we flip the switch to go do, to start doing MRIs, start looking, because there's probably something there. Unfortunately, sometimes things get out of hand. We had this 40-year-old uh, Chinese guy who he had a little creeping AFP from like like 15 to like 20 or something. So <clears throat> I did an MRI in May, uh, and we told him to come back, you know, th uh, you know, three months later, you know, uh, in September or October. He didn't come back until December, and his AFP was 4,000, and he had an eight-centimeter tumor by that time in like six months. It's, it was just out of control, uh, you know. I <clears throat> still so May should have come back in August. He came back in like November. You know, he was like two months late for his for his um, for his MRI. It was, it was, so if you see that sort of thing, you know, we have a high level of suspicion. Some of the question about the clinical trials you were mentioning probably going to have more of them coming coming in. So in in terms of inclusion exclusion criteria, do they <clears throat> mainly include every? Pretty much every patient with DNA. I think the Ananta one will. Um, the, the assembly one only wanted E antigen positive patients because uh, they had higher S antigen levels. So they were hoping to get a um, more significant drop in S antigen. So um, I think the other, the newer trials are tending to do both, have both E antigen and E, e, e antibody positive patients. Generally, they don't have to have elevated liver enzymes. They generally have to be on a stable nuke for at least three months, something like that. And the Delta trial actually says the same thing. I think you have to be on a stable nuke for three months. What's the percentage of Delta infections they don't care? It's, it's really hard to say. Um, we had Max look at the database, and he found 300, I think, right, with who were antibody positive. Yeah. Right. Uh, we don't know how many of those are viremic. So 300 in the whole 10 million patients we have in our EPIC database here. So it's a small percentage. I mean, it's pretty high and it's from certain areas. Mongolia, for instance, yeah. it's huge. Uh, the ones we see are largely from the former Soviet Union, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Um, we do see some Asians, some Chinese, with uh, with hepatitis with Delta, actually as well, um, uh, which is kind of rare. But we, so we have to just check everybody, you know, do it once. And we do have with this study, we actually have a free 
quantitative PCR that we can get for Delta, actually, at Quest. So we give them the Quest lab slip, and they charge it to the company, actually. I think the one that um, Tatiana just sent had like 150,000, uh, you know, I use a Delta PC, you know, PCR. So, and we've, so we've got like three or four Russian-speaking patients. We have Tatiana see them actually on Fridays, uh, so she can speak directly to the, uh, to the page. We don't have to call a Russian translator. Right. Actually, so far, they seem to be all Russian. <laughs> all right, thanks,